Hi guys, it's Duncan from 21417A Robocos Robotics and today we're going to be doing our end of year robot explanation. Just uh, show off a couple things on our robot that were kind of interesting because uh, our builder put a lot of work into it and uh, yeah. We're going to start with our drive. We were doing a direct 600 RPM six motor drive. You'll see the motors one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so all our wheels are geared together. We have the anti-slip wheels in the middle, I guess traction wheels, but that was just to keep us from getting pushed to the side. It actually kind of resulted in our drive getting locked up when we got pushed from the side, uh, but we really didn't have any substantial problems with it. Uh, you can see our Odon pods here, rotation sensors with half cut uh, Omnis. That was just to get them in there. Our builder uh, kind of put those in as an afterthought. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, also one more interesting thing that we did do for a couple competitions with this robot. We actually had a seven motor drive for about two competitions. It was more of a design feature, uh, but having a 600 RPM drive, we didn't have a ton of pushing torque. Uh, we were still able to push some people around, but essentially we just had, it's, it's pretty much just a pneumatic uh, shifter uh, pretty much a standard PTO mech. So it was gearing this motor to the drive. So you can see, so it was right in here. Uh, the gear would just flip from the intake, which we had a sprocket here, and then it would flip back to the drive. And that just gave us a little bit of extra pull, uh, but it really didn't make a substantial difference. And we also did not use it a ton in rounds because it meant going backwards, we would just fire any disc we had in our robot and we eventually took it off to save weight and optimize our robot. So all our wheels are geared together just to get max power, uh, give it as much torque as possible. And so you can see these middle gears are the 24 tooth uh, steel Vex gears. And we saw those in half. Just to save weight, you get two gears out of one uh, and it was just a handy design feature we had um, during this year, really compact. Um, I think that's pretty much it for the drive. Uh, so we had these back wedges here made out of uh, high strength axles. So we had a hole drilled through them. We bent them using a metal bender. I think we only broke one shaft doing that. These are probably stress fractured or something awful. Would not recommend bending them like this, but they did not break on us. They worked for most of the year. Uh, so we have these zip ties to hold them down, keep them from flipping up, because they can do that. Also acted as an anti-tip for our robot, because running a 600 RPM drive and then going in reverse can result in the robot flipping over. Um, we only did that like twice at practice, but this was just an extra precaution to make sure that didn't happen at competitions. Uh, they are not tensioned down or anything, just to make sure we can slide off disc. Uh, so disc wouldn't ca get caught between these. Um, and those worked great for just helping us uh, push other robots, especially since we had that low torque drive ratio uh, we were using and could not really substantially push bigger robots. Um, so another thing on our drive, uh, which helped us go over the barriers was just angling these uh, shaft collars. Sorry, I forgot what that was. Um, so we just angled these shaft collars, filed them down, and that just helped us go over the barriers. And then there were also these long L-channel slides that we had on the base of our robot. So that did two things. So during our skills autonomy, uh, we started out with a move that basically slides across the barrier. And the drive was actually high enough where if it came in at the wrong angle, it would drive over the barrier and then our whole autonomous would be ruined. Uh, so that was one reason. And also it slid out and that was just to help it slide against the uh, barrier. So the bottom roller, it's a floating roller. Uh, we braced it with a high strength shaft that we cut in half uh, just to take up less area and provide more strength. We originally had L channel and then ran into something, I forget what it was, and that just bent it and jammed everything. So that actually turned out to work pretty well. Uh, we had our Lexan 
guard on it just to knock over the stacks. And this bottom roller is also active. So the string right here actually goes to a cylinder that's in the bottom of the robot. So if I push this, you can see that it goes up and then that was just high enough to so take it. And so that cylinder also doubles as a block of that gap there. Uh, so we could do match flows and continuously run the intake without the disc going down back through the intake system and going out of the robot. So let me take these discs out really quick. So moving on to our second roller. So our second roller was the most important for spacing wise. You might be able to see it right here. Uh, so the motor for it's right here and we had to get the spacing exactly right just so the disc would actually flip over under the compression bar. As you can see one goes in pretty easily, two, three, and then just spin it in reverse. So that actually worked pretty well. It's a pretty compact intake system. Uh, we've liked it so far all year, although it's really hard to tune on a bot this small. Uh, let me show you our tensioner really quick here. So our tensioner, uh, pretty basic four bar. We use triangle banding to keep banding, to keep tension consistent all the way up and down uh, to reduce friction. Uh, cause our roller mech is actually also off that intake. Um, so basically this goes up as the discs come in. Let me run a couple more through. So that's just to keep the disc flat and against that bottom roller. So we can shoot really fast and it keeps it in contact with that bottom roller. Uh, so let me pull these out really quick. So our tensioner was an active tensioner. So we had a pneumatic cylinder that is connected to the four bar and basically during skills when we wanted to do match loads we could fire that so it goes up tensioner raises this cylinder on the bottom goes across the gap to keep this from sliding down and then for the match load slide we were able to just drop this in and spin the index or reverse at the same time So we did have a passive roller mech that we put on right before Worlds. Uh, we took a lot of inspiration for this design from a 9364C Speed of Light. Uh, they were running one at Wisconsin SIG and we took some inspiration from that and improved the design for our robot. Um, and we were able to use this at Worlds predominantly because the rollers were so tight, especially on skills, we were able to just ram all the rollers So moving on to our back roller mechs. So these are geared from the in intake. They're sprocketed up to about a 61.5, uh, actually 62.5 RPMs. Uh, and it was a little bit tricky sometimes getting it to spin rollers, especially really tight ones when there's three discs in the intake. It's just a lot of strain on the entire robot, but it worked for most of the year until Worlds and then uh, we added the passive max, so that basically took care of that. So next I'm gonna talk about our triple angle change. We were one of the only teams actually running a triple angle change, uh, and we did that just to get the ideal angle for match loads and then the ideal angle for overloading. Uh, so it's two cylinders, uh, both pneumatic, and so the way it works is this top cylinder fires first when uh, our driver presses a button, and so that sets it to the middle angle. And that top one has this Lexan bar, which is attached to a shaft collar, which goes uh, on the other shaft and is able to slip actually, just so when we drive it up to the highest angle, it is able to just slip and we don't have to do any weird mounting stuff with this top cylinder. Um, so this is our overloading angle and you can, then you can pretty easily do it all the way back down. Pretty satisfying sound actually. So next we're gonna move on to our flywheel. So we've been using a 3600 direct drive uh, to the flywheel all year pretty much. And that's what we were running at Worlds. Uh, this is a motor cover on the motor. We got a lot of questions about that. Like, what is that on your motor? Yeah, it's just a decoration motor cover that we 3D printed, just slips on over there. Uh, just, just for a little extra 
uh, decoration. And so on our flywheel, we've been running a speed up wheel, which is running slightly slower than the main wheel. And the main wheel is two flex wheels and um, they're weighted. The two flex wheels were mostly for weight and we filled it with nylock nuts just to add some additional weight. And it has the Lexan top and bottom to reduce air drag and stuff like that. Um, and we also made sure to brace our flywheel just so it doesn't flex out and that just helped make disc more consistent. And one more thing on our flywheel, uh, to keep the disc from curbing over a long distance, we had this little screw with some spacers that can roll and that just kind of bumped the disc back over and kept it from drifting to the side too much. Uh, kept our shots pretty straight for most of the year. So going back to our, our motor, we used uh, a high strength spacer with zip ties through it, a lot like a 606X. Um, and basically that just compression fits over the gear on the motor. And then we just used a high strength, low strength adapter uh, to power our flywheel. We didn't have any issues with the low strength, so we kept it. Uh, we also didn't use any Versa hubs, which was kind of interesting. Uh, we just used uh, some tread links around a six tooth sprocket. And uh, that actually worked fine the whole year. No uh, ball bearings or anything, just regular bearing flats. Uh, and so that actually worked pretty well through Worlds and through all our competitions. Now moving on to our in-game mech, so we've redesigned it a lot this year. Uh, there's been a lot of testing that's gone into it. Um, so pretty much our whole in-game was, originally we had this bar on the top, but we changed that for Worlds just to make it cleaner and easier to reload and stuff like that. Uh, so we've used standoffs with holes drilled through them uh, on L-channel. And essentially this whole mechanism, we're gonna fire it in a second. Uh, so this cylinder would push itself down, pull this L-channel bar down, and then release all of these standoffs and release the projectiles. And a special thing we were doing was using latex tubing, which is essentially a giant rubber band, made the whole string a projectile, and um, it, we were able to just fire these zip ties instead of using weights, and it also just slid on the ground as opposed to bouncing out or anything like that. Uh, we did shoot out in the finals at Worlds, but that was just because we were like three feet away from the wall and had gotten pushed that way. Uh, so that was an unfortunate thing, but the projectile actually didn't go out. It was the tubing that flipped over. Uh, so we did not have any of the projectiles go out while using the latex tubing, except one time, uh, which unfortunately was also in eliminations. Um, but that worked super great. We were getting pretty consistent 27, 28 expansions for most of the year after switching to latex tubing. Uh, before we fire, let me show you our lower 45 degree angles. So these cover the outer six tiles and we used to have them up here and pointing directly down, uh, but then we put them under the barrier just to reduce risk of shooting out and stuff like that. Uh, so same concept as the top, standoffs, uh, the release mechanism is different. It's just single acting pneumatic cylinder with a pillow block that would just push off and release this. Uh, but other than that, exactly the same as the top, except a lot shorter. Um, so let's fire this now. We're going to fire our end game now, uh, just to demonstrate kind of how it fired. So here it goes. So you can see we're not quite at the halfway point of the field, but it had basically no um, substantial height to it until after it got past about a foot in front of the robot. So that just allowed us to shoot over other robots that were in front of us, but to drop really quickly. And you can see that was our longest, most powerful one, and that was nowhere near going out of the field. Uh, so let me put this back up. So you can see that that was the whole uh, expansion mechanism here. And the cool thing about using the latex tubing too was it gave us kind of a quick release. So we just tied knots in the end of this. So that's enough of Zippy right now, and we're gonna bring in the real star of the show uh, to Zippy. Uh, so this was a Mingo Mech catapult that we built to scrimmage with uh, here on our practice field. Uh, we ran a bunch of scrimmages before Worlds between us and another driver. And um, 
We also took this to a Purdue Sigbots VexU VRC pre-world scrimmage and got to compete as a VexU team there. So this is actually a 15 by 15 inch robot. So intake folds in and then we had pneumatic boost on it so it could make roughly five disc from uh, during Auton, could do rollers. So we were running about four pre-Auton bands which just uh, flipped or just slipped onto this little standoff here and then when the catapult fired, these would all slip off. And uh, so we're gonna intake. So you can see we got that pretty smooth for only having like three days to tune this. And then firing. So we were using a distance sensor, which you can see down there, and just a piece of Lexan. And as soon as that piece of Lexan crossed the line of the vision sensor, it would just stop. Uh, so our roller mech, so to get it to fit in the 15 inch uh, limit, we, um, we had to use two inch flex wheels. And those actually worked surprisingly well because they had a little bit more torque on the rollers, but they have a ton more uh, squish and the robot did ride up on the rollers quite a bit because it's like a 12 pound robot, no end game. Uh, so that actually worked pretty well here, I can show you. Hi YouTube, subscribe to Robocast.